Okay. And in which war did you serve? Uh, Vietnam. And what was your branch of service? Branch of service, United States Navy. And what was your highest rank? Uh, E4. And in what general locations did you serve in? Maryland. And uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And were you, where were you living at the time? In Sharon here. And do you recall the exact date that you enlisted? Well, we all Sharon boys got on a bus and we went to Torrington and then we went to New Haven and we all had our physicals because we all got our draft notices at the same time. Everybody I went to school with and um, I came home that night and the next morning I called the draft board in Torrington and wanted to know when I was going to be drafted. And the lady said, well, it's not very hard to find your name. You're first on the list. You will be drafted in April. So I uh, didn't want to be drafted. So I went and uh, met with Tony Sesco down in Torrington, and he was a chief, and uh, he was with the construction battalion. He was a chief in construction battalion. I knew him for years, and he swore me into the reserves. And that was in May of 1965. And how old were you at the time? Hmm. <laughs> you got me on that one. I think I was 21. And uh, so you joined because you didn't want to be drafted. You'd rather enlist. Yeah. Okay. And uh, why did you pick the, uh, the Navy? Why did you join the Navy? Well, <laughs> let's see. I was told that when you're in the Navy, you always got a clean rack to sleep in, and you didn't sleep in the dirt, and you didn't eat sea rations all the time. So that's why I joined the Navy. And uh, tell me about your first days and when you went to basic training and all that. Well, we, uh, a bunch of us from the area joined the Navy, and we all went together down to New York City. In New York City, we were, uh, because when I first enlisted, I was in the reserves. Got a three-month deferment. Then when the three months is up, which was October of 1965, uh, Delaney and uh, uh, Rivard from Canaan, uh, two guys that I went to school with, we went down to New York City. They swore us into the Navy, and so that's when my four years started at that point in New York City. Got on a train. All of us went together. There was uh, this whole company. This was all from New York City and uh, New Jersey and Connecticut. Um, we all went by train to Great Lakes, and we left in the afternoon, and the next morning we were in Great Lakes. Then when we were in Great Lakes, this was a big push. This was a big push. We had so many people there, it was crawling with people, and there wasn't room to sleep. There wasn't room, they were just, the barracks were just crammed full of recruits. So the idea was to push us through as fast as they could, because they just didn't, they had more behind us, and uh, they were just they were just so. What we did generally when you go to Great Lakes, you stay in one barracks the whole time. We moved three four times, oh, wow. and every time we moved, we had to start all over again. So we were I was in boot camp about six or seven weeks. Generally, it's ten to twelve weeks, half the time boot camp was. They said, well, when they get in the fleet, when they get on the fleet, then they can learn. So, boot camp. After boot camp, I came home for some leave. And then I was assigned to, my next orders were for Washington, D.C., Andrews uh, Air Force Base, half of its Navy and half its uh, Air Force. I was stationed there for 10 months on what they called um, a deferment again because they didn't have room for us in the schools. So I stayed there 10 months. I worked in the maintenance department at uh, Andrews Air Force Base 
worked with a civilian named Bill Sizzler. And Bill Sizzler um, was a plumber and a steam fitter. Now to back up a little bit, before I went in the Navy, I went to welding school and I was a certified welder. So when I went in the Navy, I was hoping I was going to be able to use my welding skills. Well, when I was at Andrews, they used my welding skills. I did all the sprinkler systems for all the hangers. The end of 10 months, I was ready to go to Memphis, Tennessee and go to A school. I went to A school and, and upon entering A school, they gave everybody a test, an aptitude test. Well, I wanted to be a structural mechanic, but because I was 11 hundredths of a point short of 70, I had a 69.89 average. 11 hundredths of a point, I was put in, I was put in as a reciprocating engine mechanic. Oh, okay. So my CO there said, well, just finish the school. <clears throat> when you get done with the school and you get to your next duty station, then you can change your rate. Well, I went through school and I graduated as there was two kinds. If you didn't pass the test, you were just a, a, in general aviation. But if you passed the test, then you were a designated striker. Then you couldn't change your rate. <laughs> so when I, uh, I was at uh, Memphis for 12 weeks, had an exciting time there, learned a lot. Um, there was a lot of mentors there, older sailors. Do you um, remember any of those instructors? Uh, instructors, yes. The, uh, the uh, exchange were all of the uh, basketball courts and all of all the stores were, it burned down while we were there. Oh, wow. Um, so then after I finished A school, they give you a dream sheet. When you're finishing A school, they give you a dream sheet. And on your dream sheet, you can pick dirty where you want to go whether you want to go to sea or you want to go on land so i had a girlfriend at, at in patux or down in washington dc so of course i wanted to be close to her so i picked maryland and my first pick was patuxent and i got it so when i got to patuxent um i was in flight test Patuxa Naval Air Test Center is for um, is for um, ensigns coming out of Annapolis, and what it is, they have flight tests, weapons tests, service tests. They have pilot test pilot school there. It's a major base for training pilots. They have a on land simulator for a catapult because these guys were eventually going to go on aircraft carriers. So they have a simulator, land simulator of a catapult and a resting gear, the same thing you have on a ship. And it's, and it, and it, when the, when the pilot's coming in for a landing, the ship is rocking back and forth and tilting back and forth. And so the pilot has to adjust for land. So this is where, principally where I went to work. While I was there, they put me in flight test. And while I was in flight test, I was assigned this airplane right here. Um, I worked with a first class, uh, Francis Belk was his name. And he and I flew with this airplane as plane captains. So they sent me to plane captain school. Because I was a reciprocating engine mechanic and these had reciprocating engines on them, that's why they sent me to school. So they sent me to school. I got out of school, I think it was uh, two or three weeks. The next thing you know, we were doing a deployment to San Diego, California. So we got all our baggers together, 75 sailors of all ranks and mechanical skills and everything. We take all our tools and clothes, pack them in an airplane, fly from Patuxent to North Island, load them on the Super Connie CBA 64, and we go out and play in the in the Pacific Ocean for three weeks. So we can get these guys trained so that they can fly. Because we're the big push for Vietnam, now this was 65, 66, it was people coming out of the woodwork. I mean, there was 
literally no place to sleep sometimes. Now, with so many people coming and you having a rush through to get through training and all that, did you ever feel that you weren't prepared for everything? Oh, no. Oh, no. You got, no. You got the amount of training. Oh, no. There? Because when I was in A school, mm -hmm. okay, I got training on how to start an airplane up. Yeah. So that when I went and I got on this plane here, uh, Francis Belk and I, he was on 12 hours, I was on 12 hours. So we had a 12 hour split. So wherever the plane went, one of us was in that plane all the time. And this plane here had many different pilots. It was principally what they use this airplane for is to get the mail on land and fly to the aircraft carrier, land on the aircraft carrier, take the mail off. We may stay on the ship a day or two and then we uh, go over to the catapult. It's my job to run around out of the back door of the plane, run around the plane, run over to the catapult officer, tell him how much the plane weighs because the catapult is adjusted to the weight of the plane. Mm -hmm. And you get back and then come back in, get in the airplane, put your strap on and hold on because your eyeballs are going to go this way when they shoot you off this plane, shoot you off the aircraft carrier. So I did all that for about three months. Oh, wow. Came back from carrier calls and the next thing you know, I get orders to move. And where did they want you to move? Aircraft Maintenance Department, AMD, which is right up, big huge hangar up here. Operations with the big towers over here. It's right in the middle of the base, right in the middle of the, uh, uh, the airstrips cross like this. <coughs> I was, I was uh, assigned there because of my welding experience. Oh, okay. And where was that located? In, uh, in Lexington Park, Maryland. Oh, okay. That's where Patuxent is, Lexington Park, Maryland. Okay. And um, so how long were you doing that, doing that assignment? Well, um, I don't know the exact date. I think it was um, the beginning of late 67 or early 68. Because I was there about two years at AMD. Um, but at AMD, there was an E9 chief that was my boss. Um, and uh, he put me on special projects. Because uh, Patuxent River, Maryland is where McDonnell Douglas has their engineers. Uh, Grunham has their engineers. Uh, all the, all the manufacturers of all the planes around the world. And the test center, what the test center does is if they have a AE-4 Skyhawk in the fleet that had a nose gear that failed on taking off and landing, they fly that plane back to Patuxent and we fly that plane and fly that plane until we break it. And so we had all these young pilots, they call them, we call them jockeys, they get in these planes and they would just beat them to death, try to make them break. And so all the planes that were in the fleet, whenever they had any problems, the engineers from McDonnell Douglas on the J7, uh, uh, J79, the Phantoms, if they had a problem in the fleet, the Marines or the Navy, they brought all the problems back to Patuxent and AMD was the personnel that supported the civilians and working on these airplanes. So my experience went right through the roof because I was working with civilians. I was trained, went to school in the Navy, and I had I was working with civilians. So talk about the crew facts of experience that I was getting. Um, during this time when I was there, um, a bunch of, uh, two or three of the guys from my outfit, uh, AMD, uh, decided to see if they could get orders to Vietnam. And um, my E-9 chief said, not, uh, not a, you, you, you won't hold a candle to that. That's never going to happen. You're going to stay right here. You're all four years. So um, I was sent to welding certification school at Quonset Point. One of the badges here is from Quonset Point. 12 weeks of welding. I came back a certified welder. So 
Um, did all kinds of welding projects. Um, what kind of projects did you work on with the welding? Well, these squadrons, uh, we had anti-submarine warfare uh, P-3 Orion aircraft, which uh, fly very low on the ocean looking for submarines. And so Patuxent, the, uh, there was four squadrons of P-3s there, and each squadron had about 30 airplanes. They flew the whole, up and down the whole Atlantic coast, all the way to England, looking for submarines. And so that was one of the main things of the Tuxent was uh, the anti-submarine warfare planes. Um, so we had to support them. So we not only supported the, the test pilot part of the thing, it was like everything. And so that's why I got so much experience because my uh, Stubb O'Neill sent me to every school there was. He said, you want to go to school? He said, I'll sign you up for every school there is. And um, so after you were done with welding school and working on all those projects, what did you do after that? What did I do after that? Well, it just uh, spent my whole time there just working on projects. I didn't drink, and I don't smoke, and I didn't drink or smoke before I went in the service, and I didn't. So whenever they had a base party for the sailors, I was the bus driver. <laughs> You're the DD, the designated driver. So when it came time for me to get early liberty on Friday, the rest of the guys would be standing inspection, and I'd be driving in my car to come back to Sharon for the weekend. So, um, and this E-9 chief I worked for lived off base. His wife ran the post office. His brother owned the garage. His other brother uh, ran the supermarket. So I was always over to his house when I was on Liberty. I was always over to his house, uh, bailing hay. Uh, uh, a lot of my sailor friends would go over there and we'd spend a weekend there and just hang out. He had a little, uh, he had a little bunkhouse uh, that he, his, uh, his family, when they came to visit, would stay in, and we were welcome to stay in there because he, he knew that when we were leaving, it was going to be as clean as it was when we entered. Oh, nice. And uh, did you ever see combat? No. No? Well, I'll take that back. Um, do we all remember the riots in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Okay. Um, AMD, we all, 80 of us got out there in formation, and we all had straws to draw. And the guys with the short straws, they had to become the riot duty. So unfortunately, I got a short straw. So a, a Marine, I think it was an E-6 Marine, uh, did two tours in Vietnam. He was our instructor. And we had two weeks of riot duty training. And then when the riots happened, Mr. Kelsey here is 6'6". Six, six. So you know where my position was? What? I was the point of the V. Oh, okay. And so we marched in cadence down the street with rifles and bayonets drawn. And... The, uh, the rioters, they had a weapon that was pretty destructive, plate glass. So my friend on my left, his face was ripped from his forehead down across his nose and ripped his cheek, right, peeled it right up down his neck. And there was glass thrown at me, but I didn't get, I didn't get hit. And uh, so you were doing, how long were you doing riot duty? Well, the remainder of the time I was in the service. Oh, okay. But we were only we were only down in the riot duty for four or five days, which uh, of which I, I didn't have any toothpaste to brush my teeth with, and so after five days, my mouth felt like the worst garbage pail you ever saw in your life. <laughs> and uh, were there um, so you you saw a few casualties, especially during. Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah. We saw burned cars. We saw uh, they were they made a mess of DC. Um, so you were 
And um, so, and so you were never a prisoner of war. No. Okay. No. And uh, were you awarded any medals or citations? Huh? Were you awarded any medals or citations no. for your service? No. Just good, good conduct, service medal. Okay. And um, did you sustain any injuries during your service? No. And uh, so how did you stay in touch with your family while you were down in Maryland? How did I what? Stay in touch with your family while you were down Letters. Oh, okay. Letter writing. Right. Letter writing. And you wrote to all your family members? I wrote my mother and father, and so all these letters are letters that I wrote. Um, because back in the day when we don't have computers, yeah. and we don't have iPhones, yeah. and we wrote. So uh, letters... Uh, Let's see, it would be 40 years later, more than that, 45 years later. Uh, I just found these the other day. Uh, last week, I was looking, found this cardboard box with all this stuff in it. Oh. And uh, did you always have enough supplies while you were working on uh, the different plate or the different, uh, just everything you were doing between welding and the mechanic work and all that? All kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. Never had, never had uh, a want for anything. And uh, so, what did you do for entertainment during your R and R time or your relaxation time? Well, uh, I uh, Chief O'Neill's uh, brother was a garage mechanic. He had a stock car, mm -hmm. so of course we went with a stock car, and so. That was one entertainment. The other entertainment was trying to find uh, trying to find uh, some girls that wanted to go out with a sailor. So um, I had uh, I had a girlfriend in Solomon's. Patuxen is a peninsula that goes down like this, and then you have a bay here, and then you have Solomon's over here. Mm -hmm. And Solomon's, uh, one of the mechanics in the garage down there. Joseph Redman was his last name. He was a heavy-duty mechanic. He had 11 daughters and one son. Oh, wow. So he invited us over, but the only way we could get over there is he had to bring a skiff over, pick up Daryl Schroeder and I, which Daryl and I are still talking to each other. I talked to him the other day. Um, he'd come over and get us, and we'd go over there. And the big thing over there is soft-shell crabs. Did you ever eat fresh soft-shell crabs? No. Okay. The crabs, they, they, uh, when they're in molt, they're in shallow water. So you have a big skiff with a net and a pole, and you pull and you pick up the soft shell crabs and you put them in the bottom of the boat. Uh, Ma Redman, would, they had a big table in the backyard, 15 feet long. She had a big pot that she used to heat butter in. And she had another big kettle, and uh, they'd get the fire going early in the morning, and Daryl and I and Ann and Carol would go out in the boat in the skiff and go get crabs. And so we always had an order from Ma Redmond how many crabs you needed, because we got 15 people to feed, and all the neighbors would come over too. So we'd go out there for two or three hours, get all the soft shell crabs, bring them in, they'd take them out of the boat, wash them off with a hose, put them in the pot, and dip them in butter. Oh my gracious, talk about a delicacy. <laughs> Did you ever go on leave? Huh? Did you ever go on leave? Well, uh, not that much because I used to come home on weekends when I get a long weekend. Like I, if I got Friday off, I drive up Friday. It takes six hours to go from Maryland up here. So uh, we'd get six or seven sailors that were at Patuxent. We'd all ride up together. And then the maybe two weeks later, one of the other sailors, he'd drive his car up. But we would always switch off, and, you know, there was a guy in Bedford Hills, New York, who was a friend of mine. He used, he used to come up every weekend, because he had a girlfriend up here, so he came home every weekend. Um, we, you know, I, I sometimes I feel guilty, because um, I was a Vietnam veteran, but I lived a charmed life, you know. I mean, there was guys over there dying, and, and, and uh, for what? I mean, look what happened to Vietnam. It, you know, it's just like Iraq and Afghanistan. We're in the same quicksand hole again. And uh, do you recall any particular humorous or unusual events that happened 
happened during your service? Huh? Do you recall any particular um, events or things that were unusual to you that happened during the service? Well, you know, one thing that I, I was in the service and I probably never heard the word conscientious objector. Okay, it was drilled in my brain that if you deserted, that you were going to get the firing squad. Wow. And it was drilled in my brain that if you messed up, they put you in the brig. And when we were in boot camp, when we were in boot camp, every day we had these guys that were misfits marching double time. And when you're in the brig, when you're in boot camp in the brig, they gave you a two hours sleep a night. So they were up all night long washing their clothes. So we, you, when you're exposed to this, it's like brainwashing. When you're exposed, if, if you mess up, this is what you're going to end up at. Wow. So when I, when I was in the service, never even thought of being a deserter, never even thought of being um, late for something. To this day, to this very day, people always say, "Hi, you're an hour early, or geez, um, you're a half hour early. I'm never late because when I was in the service, I learned the guys that came right on time, they got the worst, the worst duty of washing waste paper baskets out or doing something. They made sure everybody that was ever late, they got punished. Mm -hmm. So I always remember to this day, um, whatever doctor's appointment, no matter where I go, like today, I was early, right? <laughs> <coughs> And uh, what was some, did you play any pranks, or did you have any pranks pulled on you during military service? Do you remember anything funny? Well, we all do stupid things. <laughs> do you remember any of those instances that you'd like to share? Well, I was in uh, a Navy truck, inside the hangar, on the scale. There's this uh, scale that they wear airplanes on, and it has real slippery steel. And it was painted nice gray color. So my friends in there, they said, I'll bet you five bucks that you won't peel out. So I thought for a while. And, and little did I know, the captain was upstairs in the balcony. <laughs> so Kelsey peeled out in anger. And when you say peel out, what do you mean by that? Uh, you rev up the engine and let the clutch out fast and you uh, squeal the tires. Okay. And um, what did you think of your officers and fellow servicemen? What did I think? Yeah, what did you think of them? Did you enjoy their company? Were they... Oh, I always had a good time. I never, uh, never had a situation where I had somebody that uh, didn't get along with. Because we had an E-9 chief, and what that E-9 chief was good at, he had 30 years experience in the Navy. And his way of doing things was to make sure everybody worked together. Everybody, he would give six sailors detail, some detail to do, and us six sailors would have to figure out, well, now, who's going to be in charge, and how are we going to get this job done, okay? And that's the way it was. And so everything we did, whether it was 15 or 20 or 30 guys, whatever the detail was that we got, whether it was in the middle of the night or whatever, we always worked together and got the thing done. And so Stubble Neal always used to say that he didn't want to hear anybody crying or bitching about anything or upset with anything. He didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to do it. So when you know that that's what you're required to do, Everybody works hard and gets the thing done. And he would always, every time we had a formation in the morning or something, he would say how proud he was that we were given a task to do and we did it. And some of the tasks we did weren't very pretty. One task in particular, I was, uh, I had a license to drive a forklift. So I was on duty and there was a C-130 that was loading on these barrels of material. And it was a full moon night. It was next to operation. There was lots of light. So we loaded those barrels on, and one of those barrels fell off the back of the airplane. And when it hit the concrete, it split it open. And this reddish stuff with, like, reddish-pink fluid with 
It had a silver sheen to it. it looked just like silver dollars on the top of the material. So us sailors, we thought we were going to get in trouble because we dropped this barrel. So we, I ran over to the hangar and I got speedy dry and I got a bunch of snow shovels. We had a bunch of shovels there in the corner of the door. Got all the stuff together and took it back out there and we spread speedy dry all over the place and absorbed the stuff up and took shovels and shoveled the stuff in 55 gallon drums and the next morning we got a truck and we took it to the dump to get rid of it because we didn't want to get caught and get in trouble. <laughs> And uh, what was the material? Do you, do you know what it was? Agent Orange. Oh. And we were walking in it. We had it all over us. Oh, wow. And so to this day, I've gone to the doctors at the VA. I've explained to them my circumstances. But we have a rule. You know, when you're in the service, we have one rule. Then we get down the road 45 years later and we have another rule. The rule is I'm diabetic now. When one of the criteria of exposure to Agent Orange is you are uh, you become diabetic, but because they changed the rules and said that you have to be boots in country, if you're exposed to each Agent Orange in Vietnam, if you were in Vietnam, then you can get compensated. So here I am, 70 years old, still fighting the bureaucracy and getting nowhere because. They say because, oh, well, we can't help it what happened in at Patuxent. But I don't want to get off on this side issue. This is, this Did you is, ever get caught, though, for uh, hiding it and cleaning it up? No. Yeah. Uh, uh, my E9 chief com complimented. He actually, the next morning, complimented us for what we did. He didn't even know it uh -huh. until, until, um, until somebody over at operations uh, turned the barrel in because all the barrel has on it was a military specification number. Mm -hmm. There was nothing, there was no markings on it, it was just a plain black barrel with a red top. No markings on it, it didn't say what it was, it just had a military specification number on it, that's all. Somebody from operations, a couple months later, the barrel was laying there in the bushes, I guess, and they brought it over to the aircraft maintenance department and said, do you know where this came from? And so I, Stubb O'Neill asked us, he said, do you know where that barrel came from? I said, yeah, that's a barrel that fell out of the back of the airplane. He said, that had Agent Orange in it. Oh, man. Well, now, um, did you keep a journal with you while you were doing your service? Mm, not really. Not really? No. Okay. And so, uh, when, or where were you when, uh, well, I know where you were, but when did your service end? So, what, what year was it when you were uh, discharged? Discharged October 1969. And uh, tell me about that day. Tell me that day. Well, in one of my letters, one of my letters, I don't know which one it was. One of my letters on the top, it said uh, uh, 69 days and counting. See, uh, as you go along in time, you have new people coming in all the time. So we all had, uh, you know, I was at Patuxent, uh, say, two and a half years. So you can imagine how many thousand sailors were coming along behind me. So as you're getting to the end of your service time, there's guys getting out every day. So we used to have what we call a short timers chain. You have a little chain on your belt here. And so when you go for morning inspection, you, you take your dikes out of your pocket here, which is wire cutters in front of everybody at go, oh, there's one day less. And uh, so what was it, what did it feel like when you were discharged? How did you feel? I felt kind of sad. Sad? Why sad? Because I enjoyed my time there. Um, in fact, Stubb O'Neill wanted me to re-enlist. And I thought about it and there was something more on my mind. I had delayed getting married. I had delayed thinking about having a family. A lot of people that I was in the service with got married while they were in the service, and service is hard on a family. I mean, when you, when the husband gets deployed for six months, he's gone. So the kids have no father, and so it's, I was exposed to that while I was at at Patuxent because people were coming going at Patuxent all the time. It was like the 
the people at AMD mostly were stayed there all the time. But every other, you know, you'd meet somebody in the chow hall and you'd have a conversation with them, and then they wouldn't be there. The next day they wouldn't be there, they'd be gone. So it was Marines. Marines were stationed at Patuxent too. So I had Marine friends, I had Navy friends, and it was constantly in flux, going all the time. So when you're, you know, when you really get up to the last, last tail end before you get out of service, it's like bittersweet because a lot of people probably said, oh, gee, they couldn't wait to get out of the service. But for me, it was like, it was, uh, uh, you know, sometimes when you're used to doing what you're used to doing, and then all of a sudden you've got to change and do something completely different, and you have no idea where you're headed. But while I was in the Navy, I took an old panel truck in my spare time up at the hobby shop. I converted an old camper truck, or camper I made it into a camper because I knew when I got out of the service what I was going to do. I was going to travel around the country, and I did. When I got out of the service, the first six months, I came home. I went to Florida first. I stayed in Florida for two or three months and worked, and then I went around the country. I traveled around the country for three months. And uh, did you, so what did you do after your uh, travels of six months? Did you go back to school? Did you uh, go to work or what did you do? Went right back to work. What did you work as? I uh, drove school bus here in Sharon. Uh, I worked at Amenia Sand and Gravel. Uh, did welding at Amenia Sand and Gravel. Um, I went to work for Raymond Learsey as a caretaker. And uh, did you make any close friendships in the service? A lot of close friends. Did you, did you stay close to them after, or did you stay Actually, close? I only have two telephone numbers of two sailors that I talk to quite frequently. I just talked to Daryl out in Nebraska. I was going to go the end of July here. I was going to take a train and go out west to see my son. My son lives in Denver, Colorado. Okay. And I was going to take the train, Amtrak, and travel to Nebraska, get off the train and go up and visit Darrell, which he lives 250 miles north of Lincoln. He lives way up in the top of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen him since 1999. But we send postcards to each other. We uh, send Christmas cards to each other. So we've kept in contact. And my other boot camp, uh, boot camp buddy uh, lives in Kentucky. And I talk to him quite regularly. Those are the only two. Oh, that's nice. And uh, how did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Well, I've become, I've always been very patriotic. Mm -hmm. The flag to me is, is a, a symbol of, of, of what America is. So when I see people do bad things to flags, it really upsets me. Um, I am worried about the, the generations that we have now because they don't realize how many lives have been sacrificed. Back in April, I've been to the Vietnam War Memorial probably, I want to say, a dozen times. And this time I was at the Vietnam War Memorial and these foreign people walked up to the information person and said, how many people, how many people, how many uh, men and women are on this thing? I said, well, 58,300, whatever it is. And so the, the guy said, well, how many died on the other side? And I felt like telling who cares? There's 58,000 my age, 21, 19 youngsters, there's youngsters that just get started out in life that had their life cut short. So every time I go to the Vietnam War Memorial, I sit there and I look at those names of people I don't even know. But it's, um, it's a connection through my spirit and their spirit. And I don't even know. I don't even know who they are. But I just remember being in the chow hall at Great Lakes Maybe 5,000 sailors in there having breakfast. 
I remember the Chow Hall in Memphis, Tennessee. Big, huge place, serving thousands of people. I remember going to Chow Hall at Patuxent River, sitting with a different person every day, talking with a different person every day. I didn't even know their background, didn't know their childhood. Um, didn't make any difference, they were black, white, purple. I mean, I had many good black friends in the Navy. They were just, I uh, grew, grew up, my father, mother were taught me that way. So, uh, yeah, I, when I go to the Vietnam War Memorial, which I think a lot of people just walk by and just say, well, oh, geez, isn't this great? No, but they have no connection to it. I have a connection to it. And um, did you join any veterans organizations after your service? Well, um, I did start going to the VA hospital. And uh, you get a lot of camaraderie there. Mm -hmm. um, the VA hospital, when I first went, oh, you're one of those veterans, meaning that we fought in the Vietnam War and we never won. So. Uh, Second World War veterans always would tell me, you know, you wouldn't be here at the Veterans Hospital if it wasn't for us. And so now, when they're dying at how many veterans, Second World War veterans are dying a day? Uh, I don't know the exact number. Thousands a day. Yeah. Thousands a day. So my day will come when they'll say, oh yeah, well, here he was a Vietnam veteran. They'll finally say, well, he's a Vietnam veteran. Because when I came home from the service, there was no welcoming home parade. There was no confetti. There was nothing except my mother took a bed, a bed sheet and put it over top of my father's real estate sign, welcome home, son. I mean, the American Legion never even acknowledged I was breathing. To this day, this one, post-126 down here, I'm not even a member of it. And um, how did your service and experiences affect your life? It made me the person I am today. If, if every able-bodied person was required, that's why the draft was a good thing. The draft was a good thing because everybody had to serve. And if a person serves in the military all through my life, whenever I got a job, if most people would, oh, fill out this application. You fill out the application, you fill out, they look at it, and they put it in a pile. But if the, if the person happened to be a Second World War veteran, he said, okay, when can you start work? So if, if, when you have a connection, when you're in the military, when you're in the service, anybody that was in the service themselves, they know that the person is going to be reliable, they know the person is going to be there, they know the person's going to work hard, and they know the person's going to be responsible for what they're doing. And so, if you have all those things, then you can always find a job, and you can always earn a living. And so these kids today, you know, I drove school bus for 10 years, and I used to look in the mirror, and I used to go, God, you know what? When I go on Social Security, we're going to have a problem. These kids here don't have a clue. They're, they're clueless. They have no idea. So... This country now has a volunteer service, which we use reserves to fight the wars, but we really should go back to drafting so everybody serves in the military. And is there anything you'd like to add that has not been covered in this interview? No, I'm doing just fine. Maybe I'm talking too much. I'm sorry. I, I, okay. I, I'd like to thank you for your service and also for taking the time to be interviewed today. Well, I appreciate Somebody finally, I mean, you know, I'm 70. How much longer is it going to be before finally somebody says, hey, you over there, we're interested in you. I commend you. I think it's a wonderful project. And um, I hope that other people, because we have a problem in this country called apathy. People don't want to participate. They want to keep their privacy. They want to keep private and private, private. Well, Maybe my experience will enlighten somebody.